Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and Fine Woodworking Editor Tom McKenna, and with me this episode are Special Projects Editor Matt Kenny, Howdy. And Web Producer Ben Strano. Hello. And Jeff Rose is manning the video gear, uh, kind of behind us or in front of us, depending on your perspective. Um, before we get started with the fun, I just want to remind folks that registration is open for Fine Woodworking Live 2017 which is set to take place April 21st to the 23rd at the Southbridge Hotel and Conference Center in Southbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, You can take advantage of our extended early bird pricing. If you register before February 20th, you'll save 80 bucks. Also, one uh, kind of reminder, if if you've registered but have not booked your hotel at Southbridge, you should do so as soon as possible. Uh, For details on the event and to sign up, go to finewooderinglive.com. The reason we I mentioned the uh, the hotel is that um, space is limited there, so you want to try to you know pull up with your car and park and not have to drive anywhere else. There are hotels in the area that will overflow, but uh, if possible, you want to be on site for sure. There's some really nice hostels, I believe, in Sturridge. <laughs> One more point of business: <laughs> Fine Woodworking <laughs> is looking for an assistant or associate editor to help us create content in print and online. In this role, you'll have a chance to travel the country meeting legends of the craft, and you'll also help us discover the next generation of legends. You must be a woodworking enthusiast. Ideally, you're an active maker and have at least a basic understanding of woodworking fundamentals. To apply, go to careers.taunton.com. Don't forget to attach a cover letter and resume. Uh, Remember, the travel is required, and the Taunton Press is an equal opportunity employer. You have to say that, don't you? Yes. Yeah. I think. Well, okay. the, the, the perks of working here, too. Yeah, like eating lunch with Matt. And, yeah, eating lunch with Mike and Traveling. Matt. Having Traveling. A, an 18-inch 18, 18 jointer. Having a 16-inch, 18-inch jointer. 18. Yeah, it's big. It's big. Big bandsaw. Mm-hmm. A nice workbench. Yeah. A nice dry shop. <laughs> Very dry. <laughs> and every time we send an issue to the printer, Tom brings in donuts. Yes, and lately, uh, Renee, our publisher, has been bringing in donuts as well, just yeah, to make a, sure yeah. we're super fat. It's a donut yes. fest. Yep. So, uh, should so we get to some questions? We should probably do a podcast at this point. Meh. <laughs> what, what time? <laughs> just say we'd set up this room and just <laughs> look at it. It's a nice room. It is a new setup. I'm not sure I like the, the stools yet. It's something to get used to. That's because well. you're holding a beer. <laughs> <laughs> if you were holding a beer, you wouldn't even notice. Yeah, it feels better. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to uh, the questions. This one is from Christian. And Christian says, I'm about to start building my own workbench from Beach. Should I make the top in two pieces, like a split top Rubo style, or in one? The bench top dimensions will be around four inches thick by two feet wide by six feet long. I like the idea of a split top, but I'm not... But I'm worried that the two halves would move independently of each other and consequently be more out of flat quite quickly. That's a long question. Yeah, I don't think that's going to – I wouldn't worry about that, Uh, them moving independently and thus being more out of flat. uh, I would not worry about that. I think it's more of a practical question, you know. Do you – the only benefit I see of splitting your bench in two, bench top in two, is that you can then clamp to the bench in the middle of the bench. Yeah. Um, running each section through a planer. Yeah, but and you can not just glue it up about, afterwards. Yeah, then you... Yeah. You don't have to. I think it'd be easier to... Well, it'd be harder to assemble because you have to have the undercarriage for... To hold two independent tops, too, I guess, but... But I, I don't think it really matters. I think it's just... My bench top is a single bench top. And I've never desired to have a gap running down between the mi- yeah. in the middle of it. You know, you can do other things. You can have hold fast, yeah. mm-hmm. and that allows you to clamp to the bench uh, all over the place. So I don't really think I – think, I would just say it's a matter of personal preference. I've, I, yeah. I've heard from people with split-top benches that they've never used a clamp in the middle of the bench. Right. I think a split-top would annoy me because I, I could envision things falling <laughs> between the split. Yes. Yeah, like tools. <laughs> like tools. Or, right. You have to or, put a little uh, circus trapeze net underneath <laughs> in the middle. I think it looks cool if that's all you're going for. Yeah. yeah. That's all, all I care about is whether or not it looks cool. Yeah. 
Which Counts is, for something. This is why my bench has skinny jeans on. And fashion, <laughs> fashionable boots. <laughs> and fashionable boots. <laughs> <laughs> Dedicated to woodworking. That's right, my woodworking boots. How many pairs of boots do you have? Six. Six. <laughs> I just counted them up the other night. I got six <laughs> pairs of boots. I, I really don't want to ask this question because it would mean that I've thought more about this than is that six... <laughs> Yes, we've had Keep this together, conversation with people. Is that six <laughs> pairs of boots or six pairs of shoes? Boots. And then you have shoes on top of that? Uh, running shoes because I do mm-hmm. run. Mm-hmm. And then I, sneakers? I don't have any sneakers. I have dress shoes, you know, for suits. Okay. Yeah. You can't wear sneakers here, by the way. <laughs> we better, we Unless they're focused. brown and called hiking boots. <laughs> <laughs> Question number two. Uh, this one comes from Scott. And Scott says, I'm building a small box using a piece of cedar that I've resawn and planed to about 5 16 inches thick. Uh, the grain is completely vertical. I was sort of hoping to leave the box unfinished so that it would acquire a patina as it's handled. But I can envision it being used as a tea box, and it might not be a fantastic it might not be fantastic for the cedar aroma to infuse any tea that is stored inside. Can I finish just the inside using shellac to provide a barrier against odor? I'm concerned that this might cause the parts to cup. Um, well, once you glue the box up, I really wouldn't worry about cupping. Um, cup. Especially, I mean, it would depend on the joinery. You know, if you were to use miter joints, that would, you know, I guess the risk would be greater than if you used uh, like a pinned rabbit or, you know, or pinned finger joints or something. Or dovetails. And, or dovetails. Yeah. And a small um, box like that, it's not going to move that much anyway. Especially yeah. when it's uh, quarter sawn or vertical grain, as yeah. it's referred to in uh, softwoods. So mm-hmm. um, I would think the aroma issue, though, is for real, right? Because tea yeah. will, I mean. It'll infuse, I think. I don't know. Cedar will, de- I mean, that's why if you put your like cedar balls or cedar or whatever's, they do make those. I know. Yes, don't laugh. <laughs> and with your clothing, through, like you store your summer clothing for the winter, like it's, it stinks. It does stink when it comes out. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Hey, maybe if you've made one, put some tea, put a couple of tea bags in there and see what happens and see if your tea tastes like cedar. I mean, sh- shellac is going to do something. Well, shellac I know works for. Odors other than like the wood, you know, I had bought some uh, a piece of furniture from a tag sale years ago and um, the drawer smelled kind of funky. I don't know exactly what it was, but you didn't ask. <laughs> I didn't want to know, <laughs> but I, um, I read somewhere. It was actually from fine woodworking, um, put a coat of shellac on the inside and it would eliminate, eliminate the odor and it did. But I don't know if it would work with cedar because that's inherent in the wood. I'm not sure. But there's, with proper joinery, there's no downside to putting a coat of shellac on the inside. It might not do the trick, but it's not, like, a, a wash coat of shellac isn't going to be enough to the other offset. O- the other option is just to say don't use it as a tea box and leave it unfinished completely. How many people actually put tea in tea boxes? Um, I don't know. It depends. Besides is, Pekovich. Is it going to be loose tea? Is it going to be tea in little packets? Uh, there's a lot of questions. Cans of tea. Cans the, of tea. The, cans. the accoutrements. Who cares? You know, some people have their little teaspoon dedicated to tea. <laughs> We're talking about Mike still. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. Um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't worry about the joinery. I do wonder, like, the patina he's after... It's like, I think it's cool. I, I get it. I'm not saying it's not cool. It's sort of wabi sabi. And uh, it could, but it, I mean, we're talking like 30, 40 years of use, daily use to get that patina and just put a coat of shellac on the outside too. You know, it's going to wear off eventually. And don't worry about it. You know, that's what I said. That's what Matt says. Yeah. That's sure. what I would do. <laughs> do what Matt does. Yeah. <laughs> or else. Doing that does. <laughs> oh, finally. He's getting it. Yeah. Someone's finally, <laughs> y'all are starting to understand. <laughs> hey, before we uh, get to our first segment, uh, this morning we got some news regarding the Saw Stop versus Bosch lawsuit. Um, I, the International Trade Commission had been um, set to rule on, uh, I guess, Bosch's request to, uh, I mean, Saw stops request to have Bosch, you know, stop importing the uh, Reacts table saw, and finally, uh, 
the the internal. You, I'll just read the press release um, to make it you know, this way. I don't overstep so anything or miss. Everyone it. falls asleep. Exactly. <laughs> so <clears throat> drink your coffee now. Um, the U.S. International Trade Commission, the ITC, ordered customs to exclude Bosch Reacts table saws and cartridges for those saws from entering the, the U.S. Um, and the ITC issued an order to Robert Bosch Tool Corporation saying that Bosch must cease and desist from conducting any of the following activities in the United States. Importing, selling, marketing, advertising, distributing, transferring, except for exportation, and soliciting United States agents or distributors for imported Reacts table saws. Uh, the ITC has now terminated its investigation against Bosch. So I guess that means uh, they're done and Bosch can't sell Reacts here. That uh, seems I pretty absolute. Too. Pending. Yeah, they looks like they covered their bases, but I'm sure, you know, we haven't had a chance to contact any of the, the companies for comment. Um, right. But I'm sure there'll be some sort of appeal or maybe, maybe not. Maybe this is the final, final step. Don't know. I, oddly, I, I also read the, uh, the, the ruling in addition to being uh, forbidden from doing all those things, Bosch is now also forbidden from playing croquet in the United States. I don't know why <laughs> that was included, but it was. <laughs> I was it's, really uh, gearing up for a hot dog joke. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have the edit button? <laughs> um, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I want. I, I have to imagine just like in the, everything in our legal system, it can be appealed. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the, I, I mean, there's no way it's done. Done. Right. But that's yeah. But it's it's been going on, boy, ten ten or more years now. This whole you know the patent uh, but issues not specifically with Bosch. No, yeah. no. I okay. mean, in terms yeah. of like yeah. the saw stop fighting and you know fighting with the um, the other tool companies and, over various issues, and and I think looks like they've got that patent nailed. And if, but if anyone's got the money to keep going, it's Bosch. It's Bosch. Yeah. Right. So we'll see. Stay so. tuned. Um, maybe we'll get a comment up on our website uh, in the next couple of days from from Bosch uh, about what their next step is. So um, let's get to that segment that I mentioned. Um, it's time for our all time favorite furniture of all time for this week. Oh, that's what we're gonna go uh, do in first. That's, huh? that's, that's where we're hitting. All right. Who's gonna go first? I'll, I'll let Ben go first. Bam. Bam. Bam, Bam from Ben. <laughs> um, all right, so I picked a piece, and it was, there was only one picture of it featured in the magazine. It was in an article on L tenons or miter joinery, and the picture just went out. But uh, it's Tim Coleman. Uh, it's this little credenza side. What would you call that? Sideboard. Sideboard. Is that? Is that yeah. I, I'm still unsure as the definition of a sideboard. But um, just incredible, incredible piece. The the way that the wood selection by Tim is insane. Um, just very... <laughs> just n totally nuts. Well, no, it's just, I mean, every piece is, in my mind, perfectly selected. The grain is running. It, it, the, the grain selection is so well thought out. Yeah. In just about everything Tim does. Mm-hmm. Um, just about everything, Tim. Did you hear yeah, that? He not really everything, Tim. Tim. He really oh. drops the ball sometimes and just yeah. you know, goes nuts. Oh, God. But. <laughs> here, comes, here comes my phone call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're, you're good and everything, Tim, but you're not. I mean, come on. Let's get real. We can show you a thing or two. <laughs> Do you have any photos of that piece opened? Because Tim had it, it I don't a know. crazy... Um, he built this mechanism where the center part, if it's the same piece, I think it is, it, it folds up to, to a bar and it's really cool. Um, and I remember I was there for a photo shoot and Tim is, is very smart. Before fine woodworking editors show up to take photos, he covers all of his furniture in progress with big, thick moving blankets because we're always moving it's umbrellas. He doesn't trust and stuff. us. He doesn't. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe he never said that, but but I always peek and I saw this piece when it was under construction. Then he kind of ripped the blanket off and was talking about all the challenges that he was encountering, mainly with um, this piece was designed to carry a pretty heavy load and and uh, he wanted miters and he was struggling with the the joinery and how to reinforce the miters and that's how he came up with that the, the L tenon mm -hmm. using just aluminum like aluminum L brackets yeah it, it's pretty intense well it's it's a lamination of aluminum and wood, and wood yeah um and it's a it's an incredible you know 
engineering piece, just, you know, have it holding it all, all together properly and, and keeping the, the miters tight because everything is mitered. Um, but the poles, it's, it's very subtle and the base is just wonderful. And it's, it's, you know, very rectilinear where, you know, big old honk and rectangle. And then you've got, <laughs> you've, you've just got some killer, killer, uh, curves on the base that yeah, Tim, Tim is a master at integrating the base of a stand or the base of mm -hmm. this piece organically into the cabinet above, um, it just melds all together. It's it's very very cool. He's got a, he's a master of that. It's and it's it's mid century looking, but not. Uh, well, the base is you wouldn't yeah. see a base like that on the, mid century the, furniture. The, the it's base, different. The base yeah. just makes it totally original to me. Yeah, it, it elevates the the whole mm -hmm. the whole it design. Does in fact, elevate it. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Takes it up to eleven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a that's a really nice piece. I really do like it. It's very clean and modern. And as you said, the, the use of the grain is fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, the pulls are very simple and understated as they should be on that piece. It's beautiful. Tim is the man. I'm glad, he's, I'm he's glad Matt approves. Man. Yes. I, <laughs> well, well, I'll give you a pass for this episode so far. <laughs> yes. Oh, just wait. <laughs> ben has the last word. I'm sure to disappoint you. <laughs> what about you, Matt? Is it my turn now for a favorite piece of all time? If you'd like. That's not the piece I chose. That's the piece you sent me. I'm just kidding. That is. <laughs> <laughs> this is a room screen by a furniture maker named Brian Reed. And I do believe we showed this piece in the article that I wrote in 257 called uh, How Pros Look at Lumber or something like that. Um, I should know. I mean, I wrote the freaking article. I should know what it was called. Um, but Brian does, he, one of the things that I really like about his work is that he'll take, uh, wood and cut it up sort of into small tiles and then reassemble those tiles into. He takes wood and cuts it up and makes yes. stuff with it. That's it makes, awesome. It is. That's what I like about this piece, <laughs> that it's wood that's been rearranged. Like romper room today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I really like his use of here is using chatoyants to create pattern. Mm -hmm. So you have it's all wood, but you look at it and it's pretty freaking amazing because it's not just grain. You know, it's not just, oh, look at this crazy figured wood. Yeah, it's a use of the wood in a very deliberate way to create a p pattern and arrangement and it's just gorgeous. And you have, first you have, you know, the, the arrangement of these little tiles on the panels themselves. And through the use of the chatoyants, you get these really beautiful patterns. And that pattern is picked up in the, I, I don't know if it's really fair to call it Kumiko, but that, that Kumiko-like grid work that's both in the panel then above the panel as well. And uh, it's just... Everything about it just is spot on perfect. It's the, really beautiful. The the shadow lines created by the molding around it mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Just that's subtle, but really, right. really brings over the top. Because you could you could have just hinged those panels together. Mm -hmm. But adding that that uh quarter round around it, that molding really, really creates really nice shadow lines. I love it. Well it's a it's like a frame. And then there's a frame within each frame, and then yeah. there's a panel within that frame. So um, it is – it's a ver the very nice use of, of depth and mm -hmm. offsets to create uh, create three-dimensionality, to create shadow lines, um, to create differentiation from from frame to frame to panel. Mm -hmm. What kind of wood did, uh, did he use? Do you remember? I do not remember what that wood is. Um Bird's eye or so maybe not. No, I don't think it's bird's no. eyes. I can't tell. But bird's eyes. Bird's eyes. Um, well, I don't know and, what it is. And looking at it bigger up here, and we'll we'll I'll post pictures of it. Um, I didn't realize that the grid work was not just straight up squares. Correct. It actually, if you then you, if you also look at the frames around the lower panel and the frame around that grid work, that sort of decorative grid work at the top, it has that same rounded. Yeah. Uh, feel to it, and so do the little uh, veneer panels. They're also kind of rounded. So 
it's you know he's he, he takes that one design element and sort of repeats it or uh, sublimates it from element to element. It's this is one of those pieces that the more you look at it, the more you find. Yes. And yeah. but I mean, when you just look at it briefly, it's it's a beautiful piece, but it's pretty deep. It, it's layered. It's layered. layered. Yes, it's deep. Layered and deep. That yeah. leads that leads right into mine. Yeah. Layered and deep. Which I do cake? not have a picture for. Oh, you won't need a picture for this. This will be etched in your memory forever, oh, man, and ever. Um, <laughs> my <laughs> my uh, favorite, all-time favorite piece of furniture of all time for this week is uh, it's not design-oriented, but more sentimental. Oh no! Oh no! He, he <laughs> brought is, it with him. This is going to be great. Um, recently, my mother had been cleaning out her. <laughs> That's not her basement. piece of furniture. <laughs> and that. this is the second piece of of something that I ever made. <laughs> and now you're the editor of Fine and Woodworking where I am now. Oh, my God. It's awesome, you know? I got the chatoyants, you know, going on the, the whale head. Mm-hmm. I, um, I'm i sure I used some sort of, you know, awesome stain. Jacobian, looks like. <laughs> it was... <laughs> But um, I was just, you know, it's, I'm, I'm it laughing like about the, it. The tail broke off and you had to glue it back on. Good eye. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. And I was devastated because <laughs> I had it all sanded. It was in the vise and I, I released the vise and, the, you know, that was like my first lesson in woodworking gravity. Yeah. I will be completely honest. I, right now, I am devastated. <laughs> I knew it. So, so for for our, all, for our audio only audience, I even have my name on the back. Let's describe this. Tom Tom has pulled out of a bag. It's a it's a whale on, it's, on a frame. It's yeah, whale it's on a, a plaque. It looks like it's a whale plaque. Like maybe a uh, two by twelve. Four. It's no, definitely it's two, construction it's, it's, grade material. No, yeah. it's it's a one by it's number two pine. It's uh, two pieces it's glued laminated. together. Okay. You can see the glue line right there. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, there's there's a nice. <laughs> Slack backing with uh, with corners have been rounded. There is a plaque. <laughs> there is a plaque. <laughs> We're not so and much, I, there there are some nibs in the finish. I have to say, you know, I kind of ladled on the uh, the did polyurethane. You, ladle. It did down. you wet sand to six hundred or six thousand grit afterwards? Yeah, probably or? not. Okay. Probably not. We're, it's a ninth grade shop, and even if we had any well, sandpaper, we probably only had eighty grit. You should have yeah. got that knot lined up for With the, the eye. eye. Yeah. Well, the, my original design was to carve an eye in there, but you know. Um, they didn't when let you I, when, use no, a when knife. I, when I had the finished product, I was like, I don't want an eye. Everyone else has an eye, so I rebelled against the eye. You mean like, lots of people got, made that thing? There were like ten of us in the class. Oh my I'm goodness. probably the only one that still has it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I found my mother has found the first two woodworking projects I ever did. This was number two, and it was well, the first one that bookshelf yeah. in your office? <laughs> yeah. So I'm waiting for the next one. I can't wait. So. Anyway, but it was just curious, funny how if anyone has, like, their first pieces. I actually just set up my, my first piece again in our basement for extra computer gear, and it's oh. it's a huge MDF table that's pink that I did for my wife as a sewing table. It's hideous. Well, it's funny but. because, you know, when you look at, when I look at that, I was kind of, you know, half joking, but I thought it was just interesting that, you know, 50 years, you know, 40 years ago, I made that thing or whatever. But the idea of looking back at what you've built and thinking about where you are today, and I look back at stuff I've built in the last five or six years, and I, and I kind of shudder sometimes, like, oh, you know, I'm so much better than that now. Thank I God. Wish I, could, I wish I could remake the, that piece, you know. I really don't wish you could. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to see the whale? <laughs> well, make a new whale. Do that. Let's see that. Let's see you make a new whale. Be, how, how, <laughs> video works, <'cause>, Ben. <laughs> sure, I'll spend a week watching you make a whale. Because here's the thing. <laughs> Bust out the coping saw. You good, Jeff? <laughs> <laughs> no matter how much effort you put into it, it would still just be a whale on a plaque. <laughs> you know, I don't care how much money you spend on the lumber. But it's, I mean, everybody starts somewhere. Who doesn't need a yes. whale on, on, on a plaque? Yes, they and, do. I'm not I, ma- making fun of it know? for that reason. No, no, no. But I was, I mean, like, I'm dying to see a picture of a little gardening tote or something you made. Yes. That, I would love to see that. That's on the website. It is? Yes. It is. All right. Fine well, on, the, on this piece, it's funny yeah. because it was, you know, there were a lot of curves in that, so it was a really good lesson on on the coping stone. But the first, the first, uh, I guess, first step or the first uh, 
class in the woodworking program in my high school, it was no power tools allowed. So whatever power tool had to be used, I think my instructor actually routed that gorgeous profile around the rim of the, the plaque. So I wasn't That's allowed near the, near the power tools, but I thought that was funny. I'll have to find that for you, Ben. It's, in a, it's in a blog post. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It has, I remember it was the picture of the garden tote that I made. And then I was at the time I was in the video workshop for a garden bench. So it was like the first thing I made, the most recent thing I made. And they were both garden related. So. All right. We'll, we'll dig it up. We yeah. dig it. <laughs> garden. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's a good one. I like that. All right. Let's get back to the questions. This one is from Drew. And uh, Drew says, I want to build a matching side table slash coffee table using, I'm sorry, a matching side table coffee table set using Live Edge Cherry. I'm having trouble figuring out the joinery. On one side, I'd like to do a waterfall, a waterfall style support using mitered cuts of the same slab to get continuous grain along the edge. What's the best way to join the two pieces? Biscuits, dowels, a support underneath? The slab is only six quarter stock, and I don't know what method would ensure it's, that it's strong and straight. For the other side, I was considering a through mortise with tapered legs. Would move, wood movement on the slab affect the joinery? I'm worried it may loosen the joint or that the legs might crack the top. Whew, that's a loaded one. Yeah, that's a lot of question. Um, I would say on the mitered <laughs> side. Well, we should probably describe what the waterfall edge means. I, I know uh, Michael Fortune has done a bunch of them, but it's basically a mitered tabletop that falls down on one side and, they, and you try to match up the grain. So it looks like a yeah. You take what he's talking about doing is take this long slab and cut a miter, cut it, cross cut it, and then where you made that cross cut, make a miter on each piece, and then put it back together so they're at ninety degree angle. One and of those is going to be vertical. The other one's going to be the tabletop. Yeah. yeah. And and he has end grain to end grain on the miter, so yeah. he needs to reinforce it somehow. Yeah, I, I would on this tabletop for sure. Um, for this table, I would do it. With like a floating tenon or a slip tenon. So if you had it, uh, use a domino joiner. If you do not, you could make some jig up with a router mm -hmm. and do it. Um, but I would definitely use a slip tenon. Or uh, an L tenon. An L tenon. Uh, I'll post a link to the article. Tim Coleman or yeah. Duncan Gowdy had a good one. Uh, in the article too, where he made uh, small finger joint tenons mm -hmm. and and used those uh, almost as or almost as dominoes. Yeah, the thing is, so if you use uh, a slip tenon, those are going to go in uh, perpendicular to the face of the miter. So you're going to have to make up a jig to do that. So, but if you're going to use like an L tenon then the mortise that you would create is parallel to the face of the boards. And that might actually be a little bit easier to do. But either yeah, way... I would yeah. I would do that mortise and then the miter. Don't uh, you think it would be easier to route the mortise in the end grain? I just, don't think you could... Well, it's a six-quarter, so you're looking at a really long bit. Because you've got to yeah. mortise yeah. it deep enough past the miter. And past any jig you're setting up yeah. to do that, which you're going to need something. So, mm. yeah, I don't think that, I, that would work so easily. Yeah, because Duncan's using, um, a you know, a slot mortiser mm -hmm. for yeah. that. Yeah, so just get a slot mortiser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so that's what I would do on that side. And, I mean, the other side... The, if you, I, I, it's not how I would do it uh, because there's not much resistance to racking. If all you do is mortise them into uh, the top, I would do some kind of structure underneath it. I mean, I, I'm not as, when I've made some slab stuff, it was more traditional in terms of the base that went on it mm -hmm. yeah. and that it had apron, legs, etc. So, I mean, I would probably look at, see if you can't see how Nakashima did stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could always hide a stretcher under there. Yes. If you're, if, if aesthetically you're looking for a through mortise, you can through mortise the legs and hide a stretcher. 
Yeah. I mean, I would probably, if you just have two legs, I might do like a T shape undercarriage. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of each of the, of the T part, the, the horizontal part of the T, I would put my two legs and have them a more traditional mortise and tenon joinery there. And if you wanted the decorative look of a through tenon, I mean, you wouldn't even have to do a real through tenon. You could just do a false through tenon from the top. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) But if you just do what, what he wants to do, it would not affect the joinery if you in, no. if you did those if you put them yeah. in correctly and it, it it might be fine yeah it might be fine yeah. you know but the waterfall i mean that's just screaming if you if you know somebody with a domino yeah do it with a that's, domino that's the way to do it yeah mhm domino i reckon it would be Whoa. i don't know anyone with a domino or do we you probably know about four people with I a have domino. domino i have a domino <laughs> Uh, Drew, There's two guys. people at this table. That Jeff's have holding one. a domino. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, the next question is from Stephen, and Stephen says, "I'm new to this craft, and my mentor suggested I start with a bench. I'm moving into a new townhouse with the perfect little dungeon for a workbench and hand tools to start building stuff. Is a leg vice enough for someone new like me, or is a tail vice worth the extra effort?" My mentor thinks I'll be more than capable of building a Rubo style bench at his shop. What are your thoughts? And then he adds, I've also noticed that most Rubo benches are built with the leg vise on the left and tail vise on the right. What usually governs this decision? Good guy. Well, should we start with the easy part first? Well, sure. like just two podcasts ago, we all bashed tail vices. So. Yeah. We didn't bash them, but we don't have them. I, I don't have one I, on my bench. I don't have one on mine. I, there's one on the work on in the fine wood working workshop, and I use it because it's there. But I don't think I'd go through the effort of putting one in. Yeah, and you could do things now, especially like um, Veritas just came yeah. out with a new bench. What do they call it? Wonder Dog. Yeah. But it's a quick release Wonder Dog. Yeah. And you could just use that thing if you needed a tail vise. Just you know, you'd have a couple of dog holes uh, in your bench top. Um, the, the quick release Wonder Dog. Yeah, the quick release Wonder Dog. The um, the the easy answer is why you know why do benches normally have uh, uh, the the front vice on the left and the tail vice on the right? And that's because governed, most people are right handed. Yeah, it's governed by your hand, basically. Right. So if you were left handed, that would be reversed. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're right handed, that's the way you'd want to do it. Um, you know, then the hard part of this question is, is that n- none of us would recommend a leg vice. No. No. So, uh, you know, make the Rubo bench if you want to and put a leg vice on it if you want to. But yeah. there And there are a lot of makers out there who, who make incredible furniture yeah. and love their leg vice. But yes. It, it's just something about being in Connecticut that you automatically don't like <laughs> leg vices or something. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. It's just. It, I mean, well, so, I mean, here's the. I mean, here's the. Here's the thing about leg vices. Everyone that made a Rubo bench and has a leg vise now seems to have these Moxon vices. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, of course you do, because you're not dovetailing with a leg vise very easily. You know, it's it's got, in that regard, it has the same problems as a cast iron metal face vise. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so uh, you don't be surprised if you make it with a leg vise that you might end up needing supplementary uh, work holding clampage. devices, which supplementary clampage. Everybody loves making more jigs and yeah. work holding devices. So. I yeah, like I making mean, more furniture. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I've got a twin screw vise on the front of my bench, and I go to town. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, you basically build the bench you want to make. You know, if, if you really like the Rubo style, go for it. Well, I, I mean, I have a, you know, a rudimentary bench, you know, made from dug fir posts and. You know, double t- doubled up MDF for the top, and you know it's got kind of a uh, basically a what do they call it? a torsion box kind of underneath the MDF for support, and with it loaded down with tools, it's heavy and it's got a vice on it, and got I mean, a bunch th- of you well, know. The thing uh, about benches, is, though, is that I, on the one hand, everyone it's like yeah, you want to make a bench so you can build furniture, and so people end up making benches that are recommended to them by. Woodworking magazines right. or mentors or oh, whatever. Hardworking magazines. Ooh. 
Oh my god. <laughs> well, basically, you know, I but, think the the best surprise. I think maybe you're. I don't want to. Take your thunder, so good. Yeah, yeah. My thunder's his thunder uh, is louder than mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, the best thing, really, honestly, that you can do is to make a functional, basic, right. basically yes. functional bench, yes, yes, and yes. then yeah. work exactly, and work for a couple of years, and yeah. then you'll know, hey, this is what I like to build, and this is the type of work holding I need to do, and this is the bench that's best going to satisfy right. that. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, that's why I made the bench that I made, but it's been working so well that I haven't had a desire to make yeah. another another one. I've been lucky to have, you know, multiple benches to work on, and I feel like now I know what I want in a bench, and it's, it's you know, little pieces of all of them. But when I first got into woodworking, you know, the hand tool thing, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go all hand tools and everything. And, yeah, maybe a Rubo bench would have been great, but, man, I'm not a hand tool only guy. And... There's a whole bunch of stuff that is way different than I thought I would want. And so now, after years of woodworking, I feel like I finally kind of figured out what I need in a bench. And I don't need to spend a whole lot of money doing it. I and don't I don't think, want to spend a whole lot of time doing it because, like you, I want to build furniture. I don't think you can get board stretchers, though, in a bench still. I just don't think those are available yet. <laughs> Um, <sighs> have we have we stepped on that enough? I think so. Yeah. Let's move to the second segment. This is going to be the shortest podcast ever. I don't know. I don't know. I lost my train of thought. Oh, here we are. We're now it's time fast. for our all-time favorite tools of all time <laughs> for this week. And uh, I'll throw it Matt's way first. Do not throw Duck. it my way first. Because... Hey, it's snowing. Uh, I've yet to decide what my all-time favorite tool of the week is. Ah. Ooh, bounce back. <laughs> oh, denied. Yeah. I'll tell you what it is because I was just using it last night. It is a combination of tools. All right? It's a workshop. It's a workshop. <laughs> I like my workshop. It's a dessert topping. It's a sugar box. Sugar uh, box. It is a uh, my long-grain shooting board, which I have for really thin stuff, which is kind of hard to clamp vertically in a vise and then edge plane. Um, so I have a long grain shooting board and my Lee Nielsen number nine iron miter plane. And I was using these in conjunction last night to fit the little Kumiko panels into the base of a tee box that I'm making right now. So I really like those two things in conjunction because um, – what I was able to do, sort of edging into technique now. Okay, yeah, because so you built the panel oversized. Just a tiny little bit. And then you bit. were just, okay. Yeah, it's just a tiny little bit over. And then you want to do that because you want that thing to, because it's just friction fit in there. It doesn't get glued in. So it's got to be dead on. So, uh, but also, you know, the, the, the recess that it fits into may not be perfectly square. So you want to fit it to that opening. And um, so last night I was using the long grain shooting board in conjunction with my miter plane uh, to uh, trim these down. And actually this was – I'm going to tell a little bit of technique here. So these little panels are kind of flexible, right? So what I ended up doing was taking a piece of three-quarter inch plywood and just backing up the uh, – Kumiko panel so that when I ran the miter plane along it, it couldn't flex away from the miter plane. So last night that was, uh, I was using those things in conjunction and those are my favorite tool this week because it let me get the, let me get my work done. So even the, the, so the MDF, cause your Kumiko panels are fairly open. Yeah. So the middle didn't stretch out? No, because I backed it up with a piece of... So, okay, so the piece of MDF went inside the Kumiko panel. No, 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 no. no. Behind it. Like behind it. So, like, if if the Kumiko panel's here, mm -hmm. then there's a piece of plywood. Plywood, not MDF. Okay. I don't use MDF. Plywood. With a capital P. I have <laughs> pictures of MDF <laughs> in your workshop. So. <laughs> so that just ran the entire link. So, like, they were edge to edge, abutting each other. Okay. And so when you <laughs> pressed against it <laughs> with the hand plane, it didn't flex, you know, flex away from it. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my favorite tool of all time this week. The Lee Nielsen number nine iron miter plane, which is no longer available. Ha ha. And plywood, <laughs> not MDF. And plywood, not MDF. All right. And my uh, long grain shooting board. 
Awesome. For very thin stuff. Matt alone in his shop. Mm-hmm. I was alone in my shop last night. How about you, Ben? I was listening. I was to... not alone in my shop last night. <laughs> <laughs> were you? So that begs the question, were you Where in your were shop, you? <laughs> but not alone? Were you alone, but not in your shop? Were you not in your shop and well, not alone? Uh, no, actually, I was in the in the magazine shop last night building this awesome base out of for the table that we're sitting at. Out you were in the ma- magazine plywood. shop last night by yourself? Yes. Really? You know, you're not supposed to do that. Because if you get hurt, there's no one there to take you. I've got Betsy's number on my phone. Yeah, Betsy no was about a half up. hour away. <laughs> <laughs> She's not picking it up. <laughs> She's at the beach or at the gym. <laughs> it was at 4.30. It was at 4.30. I left at 5.10, so there you go. You were supposed to be So there was your, 10 minutes of danger. You're supposed to be at your desk at 4.30. I was... <laughs> 10 minutes of danger. I was working. <laughs> I was building the base for the table we're sitting at. All right, let me see it. Dig those drywall screws. Did you paint it too last night? Yeah. With spray paint? Wow. No. Just flat black. There's no Kumiko in that base. <laughs> <laughs> Get back to work. Miters? <laughs> what kind of joiner you use there for that thing? Are we in are two we by in peril four? Right here? <laughs> no. Well, actually, no, it's not attached. So if you stood on the on the end of this table, it would tip over right now. Don't give me ideas. All right. Make for Good podcast right there. Right, what's your favorite tool then? Come my on, favorite tool of all time is... Oh, my God. All right, Pedro. Are we really... <laughs> He's not even here. He's not even here. It's not the pencil. It's the pencil sharpener. No, it's the... it's the, And I have one over there. Jeff throws... Throw it's it a belt me. clip pencil sharpener, right? Keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> it is the tape... Me- the fast cap speed clip tape measure holder. So it holds your tape measure. Oh, my God. And it holds a sharpens a pencil. It it barely sharpens a pencil. But <laughs> I, I really wish that they would. There, it's fixed. <laughs> I took the pencil sharpener part out of it because it's the worst pencil sharpener ever. And it has a pencil holder, which doesn't work very well either. No, but, it's not the worst pencil sharpener ever. We've never actually compared pencil sharpeners, but it's maybe dull. <laughs> um, speaking of great podcast, <laughs> speaking of dull, comparing <laughs> <laughs> pencil sharp. Um, but this, it, like, there is no clips on tape measures that clip onto your jeans or your pants or anything efficiently. T- Fast cap comes close. Efficiently. Yes, I just want to clip my tape measure without fiddling. I, I want to use one hand. I don't want to have to use two hands. Fast cap comes close because they have a little thumb mm-hmm. springy thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but they also sell this thing for $2. $2. $2. And you hook it onto your belt. And you hook this onto your belt or I put this on a pocket of my apron. And you yeah. keep that right next to that big leather pouch you keep your Blackberry in, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a Windows phone. It's a Windows phone. Sorry. <laughs> And but it's just a nice lip to clip your tape measure to consistently, efficiently, a nice every lip time. To clip. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for pointing out my alliteration. So diaper. But uh, <laughs> I love this thing. I bought like three of them five years ago. I'm down to one. I'll probably buy what five more next time. They're lost. They're, they're lost. They're How'd you lose it? It's on your belt. So where where does no, we know, I know the answer to this question. I'm not going to tell anybody. <laughs> wow, it's really snowing out. Um, <laughs> where do you clip the 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 tape measure on that again? Right, right next to the pencil sharpener. Right. Right, right next to the pencil sharpener. Yeah. Okay, cool. I have to admit, How much? two bucks. I have to admit, Ben, that this is probably the worst <laughs> all time favorite tool we have ever had. You have beaten. You my haven't head. been paying attention. <laughs> you haven't heard mine yet. Yeah. No, yours is good. That's awesome. Is it the string on the back of the plaque for that your whale is on? No, it's the attachment method. <laughs> the, attachment. The, the hook. <laughs> is that it, Ben? I love this thing. He loves that thing. Yeah, I just keep tape measures all over my shop. So, I love this thing so much that um, oh, my no. wife got me a, uh, a a Texas Heritage apron for Christmas, and they you know they customize them for you. And I asked for no pockets on the front because I just want a little strap to hang this thing on. <laughs> He was like, "What? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I have a follow up. Exactly. <laughs> what?" Um, what cust- other custom details did you get on your apron? I got this is going to be. Ugly. I got no 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 pockets on the front. 
no pockets. Uh, there's the top pockets. If, if you had pockets on the it. front, though, you could put your tape measure in there, and you wouldn't need the doohickey. No, because then it's flopping. No, it's not. It's flopping around. If I got mine custom made, there would be like a pocket for Swedish fish. <laughs> That's no <laughs> lie. There would be a pocket to hold like a seven ounce Coke can. <laughs> <laughs> and then there would be like a thing to hold a bottle of rum upside down, and I could just dispense <laughs> one shot at a time. Just with a straw coming just with up. With a straw coming yeah. over, over, over your hearing protection, <laughs> right. right down there. I don't drink and work in the shop ever. 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 Um, so. That's pretty funny. That's what I would do. Tom, you got you got your tool, Tom? Uh, is, I it do. Also, is it also in a bag? <laughs> uh, my tool is a self-centering bit set. Um, I didn't get the, you know, it, the, it's a, the, it's a copyrighted name called Vix, but you know, a lot of companies have started making them. They call them self-centering bits and it's got a hex shank and it's the same company that makes paper sizes. rub. Is it really? No, <laughs> no. Cause it's V I C K S for that. Vix. <laughs> Fool. No, paper <laughs> rub. But, is it really? <laughs> In a, in a recent uh, project, I was, you know, putting a door on, and um, I had never used these before, and I heard people talking about them, and, and I had gotten a $25 Amazon gift card, for, I think it was for my birthday, and um, just kind of looking through the, the tool tools and hardware section of the Amazon area, I came across these, and I was like, oh, you know, I don't I don't own these, but after using them for the first time, I, I, I don't know how I installed hinges before. I mean, I, yeah. they're really good. Amazing. How did you not ever use a Vix bit before? I just never did. I never thought about it. Just like I last in the last podcast with my uh, screw breakage. No need. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. You don't got to center the whale on the plaque. Yeah. It can be anywhere. It can just, just be anywhere. <laughs> but, but I always used a, a set of, I have a set of center punches, and that's how I kind of tried to align yeah. um, the holes for for hinges. But, it, you know, one of them would always be off a little bit, and I'd be angered by it. But this thing was like... You know, well, the great, put in the drill and zip, and you're yeah. Done. I mean, the great thing about these is that the uh, the end of the, it has that sleeve over the drill right. bit, and the end of that sleeve is tapered to match the taper right. of the countersink on a yeah. hinge, mm -hmm. so it just automatically lines up. It was it was brilliant. It, it was just life saving. If I didn't break the screws, that job would have been, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> easy the, easy peasy. The only thing, and I have a set of Vixbits, and I love them. Um, the only thing that I don't like about them is there's no way of really setting a depth stop. You're wrong. If you have good ones, you can set the depth. Really? Yes, you can. So I don't have good ones. I probably don't have Vix brand, Vix bits. I don't know, but my, mine, you can change how far the uh, the drill bit extends out. Hey. Yeah. Good yeah. To know. On these, you can too. Okay. See, so on mine, you can. You're just yeah. like, I think I'm not going through the door. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's like this microscopic uh, <laughs> hex bolt in there. So uh, before we move on to the next question, I just want to – so you got an apron for Christmas, right? Yeah. So that reminds me of something I read recently that 89% <laughs> of all British woodworkers wear a tie tucked behind an apron while milling their lumber with a jack plane. <laughs> Let me verify that claim <laughs> with my eight ball. I read oh. that. Is that why you brought the eight ball up? Yeah. To this, verify this eight ball is malfunctioning, which I don't know what that means for me. We can too move early on now. to tell. Yeah, too early to tell. Needs more, we, we, no, oh, more, yeah, more research. On. Let's get to a uh, question. This one comes from Chase. <clears throat> oh, this is really, he's insulting Matt. Oh, grand wise ones and Matt. Yeah. Uh, I love the podcast and hope you can help me with a technique question. I've been trying to add a lot more curves I don't think we can. to my work. Sorry. <laughs> I have a spin to sander that does a great job of making inside curves come out really nice, but I'm still having issues with the outside curves. I use a compass or curve template to draw an outside radius, bandsaw off the majority, and use a disc sander to run up to the line. No matter what, it always seems a little lumpy. Oh, you know, we were thinking it was that he was curves. asking about a random orbit sander. No. But he's using a disc sander. Okay, I have the answer to this. It, it, you might have been thinking that the whole time, but we corrected you multiple times <laughs> saying spindle sander, spindle sander, no, 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 spindle no, not sander. Not spindle sander, disc sander on the outside. Can I, can I finish the question? <laughs> 
Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I mean, this guy's going to be upset because I know the exact answer to his question. No matter what, it always seems lumpy. So, is this just a matter of building skill and going slow with the sander, or is there another trick? A router template is the only other thing I can think of. Yeah. Now we can. He's insulting yammer. my intelligence. Uh, so first of all, let's just get this out of oh. the way. If you are attempting to sand outside curves with a random orbit sander, stop doing that. That's not going to work. But I don't think that's what he's doing. I don't, spindle no. sander. Spindle sander for the inside curves, Ben. He's using a disc sander disc for the sander outside for curves. Why do you keep saying random orbit sander? Because I <clears throat> thought he was using a random orbit sander because when I use a disc sander to sand an outside curve, it does not come out lumpy. So I was thinking, well, it must be a random orbit sander then because that would come out lumpy. So I was just, just chill out. You need to get me angry. <laughs> I want to see that. I want to see this eight ball fly. <laughs> hey, it's snowing out. So, <laughs> so, Why do I look every time? <laughs> all right. So first of all, the answer to using the disc sander to do this is yes, it is technique. Yeah. That's the problem. Your technique is bad. The, in order to do this uh, and do it um, and have it come out smooth, you have to make that entire motion in one – it has to become one motion. It has right. to be smooth and you have to do it – when I do this and I do it with a sort of belt sander on its side and I do it with a disc sander, um, you first need to figure out – with the thing off, what that motion is going to be. Right. So you don't want to move your feet during this. You have to sort of anchor your lower body. Uh, I like to put my. <laughs> we're going to really get into this. You get the yeah, sanding yeah. boots on. Well, I mean, so I get my stand sanding, up. I get, get my sanding boots on. <laughs> I'm not going to stand up and uh, and demonstrate this. Uh, I probably should though. Should yeah, I? you should. All right, so <laughs> go, baby. Because I, I do. I do this a lot when I make templates, for example, because wh what you want to do is make a template and then route to the template. Don't try to sand every curve. Uh, so you have to stand and you want your body. Sometimes, you know, it's going to have to be like probably like this so that you can rotate. <laughs> Pivot those <laughs> hips, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, wait, wait for, for our audio only audience. Hey, can you do that backwards? <laughs> that was that was precisely the Karate Kid movement. With <laughs> so you, you have to uh, orient your your probably your your lower body about forty five degrees to the disc, and then that allows you a wide range of pivoting motion, and you have to do that curve all in one smooth motion yes. at the same speed and with a disc sander this is a problem with a disc sander is that it spins which means that the closer you get to the outside of the disc the faster it's spinning so if you're going to do a disc sander you want to try as best you can to hit the same spot on the disc That's... the entire way because if you're not you might t it, it'll tend to sand a little bit more where it's spinning faster than when it's where it's spinning slower. That's a really good tip right there. Yeah. And uh, so you want to try to hit the same spot and you want that to be a smooth, continuous motion uh, with your body. And it is possible to do it. It works better with, say, like, you know, we have that rigid combo belt spindle sander yeah. in the shop. Yeah. It works better with a belt sander on its, like, 90 degrees to the table. Because uh, then you don't have to worry about the speed, <clears throat> about hitting the same spot of the desk. And right. Okay. Um, so that is a technique thing that you could work on. Yeah. And I think what you want to do is not be trying to do this with individual parts, but you make a template. Yeah. And then you use your template to route the parts. That's... I mean, that's what I do yeah. if I'm going to be, you know, if if I'm making curves that way. It's like, say, it's for the top and the bottom of a bow front cabinet. You make a template, you route the top and bottom to the template. That way, the top and bottom are identical. Yeah. And then you don't need to use a disc sander, really. It's just hand sanding, too. It or a hand sanding. Or or, yeah. Um, yeah. But the other thing I would do if he's making duplicates when you're at the disc sander is to, you know, double up the work pieces to this way you ensure the. Whatever, both of them yeah, they're identical up. no matter – even if you make an error, at least it will match. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, the spindle sander is the same way. It has – you have to go with a continuous motion that needs to – I like to move parts past, 
past a spindle sander or a uh, disc belt sander thing fairly quickly. Don't go slow. Don't yeah. try to go to the line all at once. Um, what you want to do is get that sweeping motion and just c- repeat it over and over and over again, and it'll slowly come down, and you'll end up with a nice fair curve. And so don't sit there and try to work down to the line as you go along. That's mm-hmm. not going to work. It's got to be that smooth, sweeping motion, all one continuous right. motion from beginning to end of the curve, and just repeat it and do it fast, do it fast, do it fast. Yeah, and, and actually do, do it while you're holding the piece because you'll – see if there are any catches because if you get a catch somewhere on the table if the table has any kind of a burr or something you could automatically do what matt said and stick too long and they chew up material very quickly if you if you yeah. linger and yeah. uh, but <coughs> cool so that was a much better answer than i was expecting for that one <laughs> <laughs> listen i've done a lot a lot of curves that way a ton of curves making simple and it's all making simple sometimes i do we'll do pieces individually that way but usually it's making a template and i have to say i can get a nice fair curve that way i i've just been working on my bandsaw technique and then just hand sanding to the line mm-hmm. well the bandsaw doesn't cut it all the time you know no. well but also you know these table legs things like that where they don't have to be identical i had a friend who said they don't have to be they don't have to be identical. They just have to be related. Question six <laughs> is from Eric. Uh, Eric says, I'm fairly new to woodworking. My question has to do with miters and the utility of shooting boards. I've made a couple boxes with mitered corners and several picture frames. Until this point, I relied upon my table saw and a manufactured crosscut sled to make my mitered cuts. Although I've been happy with the miter joints I've created, I'm wondering if I could improve my technique by using a shooting board. Um, these are like all questions handpicked for me, aren't they? We knew you'd be happy. I mean, <laughs> you think that about everything anyways. So. <laughs> like it's snowing right now it's for snowing. me. That snowflake is mine. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's funny because I, I, my, my thought when I, when I read the question is, well, if you're happy with the results, why yeah. change? But Because. Here we go. <laughs> you shouldn't waiting, be happy with those results. Well, I mean, you know, uh, you think, I mean, you're happy now, but then next week <laughs> yeah. you were like, I'm not happy with that anymore. So, <laughs> you know, that's the way the world works, you know. <laughs> that's, you know, you're happy with the car you bought, but, you know, five years from now you're not happy with it anymore. So go out and get a new car. Okay. All right. All anyways, right. so here's the, here's the, here's Snow. what I would uh, say. So table saw miters... And if you have a good blade and you cut it slowly enough, you can get a really nice surface on that miter. Um, and for, I would say, large-scale work, a table saw miter is fine. Um, where I do n- stop using the table saw normally is with really small stuff. A lot of the boxes I make are small. And it turns out that at that small of a scale, the miter actually is often not good enough for a really tight, seamless joint on something that small. Uh, Because what happens is that it's small scale, so even uh, a small imperfection looks big. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I turn then to a shooting board of some design, depending on the size of 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 the part, and I will create the miter with a hand plane. And what that... what is true there is that the uh, the the point of the miter that you can get from a hand plane is far is is better than the point of a miter you get from a table saw blade, and you can get uh, miter joints that come together and you can't even see the joint because not only do you get that nice tight perfect point. Oh. He's never seen my miters. <laughs> <laughs> but you also get this glass smooth ingrain. And so it just closes up beautifully. Yeah. And so if your table saw has any run out in it, or if your blade is just a little crummy, uh, you know, just if, if it's not a perfectly sharp, you know, high end woodworking blade, you're going to get a little bit of a rough 
ingrained surface yeah. there. And then when you bring that all together, it's gonna it it's gonna keep it from closing up seamlessly. But a, a shooting board with a miter with a pan plane, you know, if it's sharpened properly, will give you absolutely perfect miters. And when you glue it together, it is perfect. Do you off the table saw when you're doing table saw miters? Do you use? Because I know you are a cross cut blade, rip blade. Rip blade. Do you switch to a cross cut blade? I do. When I cut miters, I switch to an eighty tooth uh, cross cut blade. Mm -hmm. I do. And one of the keys is uh, when you are cutting a miter is you need to slow down your feed rate uh, and cut more slowly, and that will give you a better cut. Because you're going through more depth of wood than yeah. If you cut a 45 degree miter on a three quarter yes. inch piece of wood, you're, you're cutting more wood than yeah. if you were yeah. Um, the other thing I mean, with table saw blades, I found is that they tend to you tend to get sort of a ragged point on the miter rather than a crisp, oh. clean, continuous point. It's kind of like because the blade is pushing violent, down on that point. It's a violent cut. <laughs> yes, um, it's sort of like you know it's in, in with miters. You want to think about miters like a the edge of a of a chisel or a plane blade. It's better when that the two things come together at, a, at to a point that has no defects in it. Then you're going to have a better miter. Then you just take a screwdriver and flatten out that part. Oh my god! You know someone someone <laughs> we know once said that, and I was just like, I wanted to just pound that person. I was like, <laughs> no, no, you do not do that. I'm done. Right. You, did, I don't know if everyone understood. What you, you know, sometimes when people yeah. have gappy miters, they'll take... You burnish them. You yeah. burnish them. And, it, and it's like, no, that's not what you do. You throw it out and you start over. <laughs> that's <laughs> there what you, have you do. <laughs> <laughs> you learn to cut miters. You know? Anyways. Depends where you are. <laughs> yeah, don't ever do that around me. <laughs> if you're just me, starting yeah, off. You can't do, do that you in ever Oregon. do that around me. You can't do that in Oregon either. <laughs> In Oregon. I don't know why. <laughs> All right. That's it for this episode of Shop Talk Live. Tune in again in two weeks for our next episode. Remember to send your questions and comments to shoptalk at taunton.com. And please spread the word about Shop Talk Live to your woodworking friends and neighbors. You can catch the podcast via iTunes, stream it on the web at shoptalklive.com, or catch us on iHeartRadio. Finally, you can keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook. And look for all of us on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening and have fun in the shop. It's still snowing. Who was it? What? Who was it? I'm not going to say. But you don't do that because it looks worse. I know. It looks worse than a gappy miter. Tips, baby, 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 baby. Pivot, pivot, pivot those hips, baby, 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 baby. Pivot, pivot, pivot those hips, baby, 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 baby. Can you do that backwards? Lift, lift, lift. Space or lift, lift. Pivot, pivot, pivot those hips, baby, 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 baby. It's still snowing.